So uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Greg's messed up. Are you there? Greg, he's missed that. I think I saw his photo, but he, it looked like. I, he, uh, he's, he's coming now. Uh, yeah. Of Greg. Dr. Greg. I, I am I am here. I'm just starting okay. up my slides. Hello. Very good. Very good. So <laughs> greeting, uh, greeting to you all. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope you, you still have my 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 uh, prison in, on your wall. That's what you showed me last time to just remember me. So I do. I do indeed. Uh, OK, thank you very much. And uh, I I remember all the time we spent together in 1992 in, in Berlin. Uh, of course, at the time, we uh, we had uh, a lot to try a lot of experiment on iron disulfide, I remember. So I'm very happy that you are with us today. So I I just want to say that Greg Smithstad, he's in California now. And we, we had a lot of time together. He start together with me and the Professor Tribuch in Han Maitan Institute. At the time, it's called Han Maitan Institute. Now it's Helmut Centrum Berlin. And uh, he, he moved to, uh, he don't stay in Berlin, but he moved to Switzerland where he worked with uh, Gretzel first. And then he, he went to, the, to the another institute, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And he received his master's degree in material science and engineering in 1985 from Stanford University. And you know, Stanford is a very known university. His bachelor in biology in 1983 from the University of Santa Clara in California. From, from uh, 85 to 90, he was employed by, by Howlett Packard. So he now the industry and uh, all what uh, before uh, Dr. Akalai had talked about it. And from 90 to 92, he was uh, at the Han Maitan Institute, as, as I told you, where, he, where we he met him and we worked together. So he contacted uh, solar research at Paul Scher Institute in Switzerland to get his PhD. Uh, together, he worked together with uh, well-known Gretzel, the one who, who invented the Gretzel cell huh? with dye synthesization. So also. In 1994, he was employed by Leverance Berkeley Laboratory, National Laboratory. From 95 to 2002, he was professor first at the California State University, Monterey Bay, and then at the uh, Monterey Institute of International Study. He currently works on optoelectronic and solar energy consultant. He served as an editor of uh, solar energy material and solar cell from 90 to 2016. And uh, we worked together also in, uh, as an editorial board. He was, uh, he was as an editor in the solar energy materials also. Uh, Dr. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you that you, you, you take all your time to help us at the Virtual Learning University. The floor is yours. I know that the subject what you are uh, developing about uh, soiling and all this very uh, complicated uh, problem where I walked a little bit uh, when I was in, in Qatar. And uh, we are looking forward to hear your talk. And the title of your talk is The Basic Physics of Soiling in Solar Power Plant. So the floor is yours. You can share with us your, your screen if you want. I'll try. So you see here what you yeah, gave Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's. That's my, my, it's from Morocco, this, this, this. It is, I've here. kept, yeah. I've kept, yeah. kept it as uh, one of my prized, my yeah, prized yeah. possessions all these years to, yeah, yeah. to, uh, I, to remember I like our time it. together. Yeah, yeah. The, so you see the innovation, we have also the innovation in artisanal stuff. Absolutely, in, in absolutely. I've, yeah. I've prou proudly taken it from place to place where I live. Okay, thank so you. So let's just see about sharing the slides. How would I do that? So you have just to go down, and there is a, there is one one green indeed, bottom. In, indeed, I should Doro. be able to do that and to say share. But but, but before you have to open already your 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 PowerPoint presentation. 
Now, Indeed. Yeah. Fine. Very good. Very good. And now we Got say. It. You have to make it bigger. And now we say bigger. And now we do this. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. Yes. All right. So thank you, uh, all of you. Uh, thank you to uh, for, for making this happen and giving me this opportunity uh, in this next half hour or so. Um, I also like to thank the the organizers for the uh, Expo Maroc uh, Solar. Uh, so the agenda today, uh, we will talk about uh, an overview of soiling. What is it? We'll introduce the concept of a soiling ratio, talk about light scattering, the wavelength dependence of this scattering, of the effect of these particles. Uh, I will introduce what is called the angstrom turbidity formula, which is known in the field of solar energy, but I have uh, done some innovation in, uh, with my colleagues, uh, including uh, Leonardo Michelli. Uh, to use this angstrom turbidity formula for soiling on surfaces. We'll look at model versus experiments, very applicable to students. The context, the larger context, because Leonardo Michelli will talk to us uh, about how we take this further to look at uh, whole systems and to look at the monitoring of soiling and the mitigation. And then conclusions. So what is, uh, what is this thing called particulate matter that you saw in the last slide where the particles from the atmosphere deposit on solar panels or they deposit on solar mirrors for uh, CSP or concentrator solar uh, power systems. So this is the concentration in micrograms per meter squared in the atmosphere. That's where it starts. And these are particles uh, sometimes that are uh, less than 10 microns, we call that PM10. We can find this uh, with atmospheric monitoring stations. And this is dust stirred up by roads or vehicles. We also have PM2.5, which is also found uh, with sensors that we have for our atmosphere in many locations, and that's motor vehicles, power plants, residential wood burning, forest fires, agricultural burning, and industrial processes. And these are the particles that we start with. Here is my cousin's uh, solar panel in Los Angeles, California, David Bernal. And you can see uh, what we mean by soiling in a photovoltaic station. In this case, you can see that it's highly non-uniform, but it extends over the surface of a photovoltaic module. This is not just uh, for a residential system, but even in a uh, utility grade system. Here is cad cadmium telluride and the first solar cad telluride array of Marcus Beck here in the coastal mountains of Northern California. We see soiling can also be uh, deposits by birds, in fact. So what is soiling? It's the accumulation of dust, dirt, and particles on the surface of PV modules. And we can have a drop in power, especially in places like Morocco and other places in the Middle East that can be greater than 50%. So Ahmed and I, we spent so much time uh, all of you have spent so much time to try to make solar panels efficient, but yet the drop in efficiency, the drop in power output can be substantial. In other places, it can be uh, uh, here in the US, uh, uh, somewhere between nothing and maybe 6%, but you could have in some places 0.5% per day losses. So what will scatter the light? You can have a surface that is rough, uh, spherical particles, not so spherical particles, uh, a film residue, all of these things will scatter the light. So at first here, let's talk about the uh, spectral effects of soiling. We will talk about the, uh, for some of you, this is a new concept. We'll talk about the uh, solar cell uh, external quantum efficiency or EQE and related to it, the spectral response. Then we have to talk about the incident solar spectrum, the solar ratio, the soiling ratio. This concept, which I told you before that I've introduced with my colleagues, the angstrom turbidity formula. We modify the formula to make it 
applicable to surfaces like the surface of a mirror in CSP or the surface of a photovoltaic panel, as you saw in the pictures. We can fit to the data and look at the visible and near infrared hemispherical transmittance. So that's where we're going. So I hope that some of you have seen this. This uh, top figure here is the, um, the spectral response for many types of solar cells. So Ahmed mentioned uh, when we were working together, we were doing uh, iron pyrite, FES2. Uh, this has a spectral response, which is uh, not shown here, but it's very similar in the band gap to monocrystalline silicon or polycrystalline silicon. But different materials have different spectral response or uh, external quantum efficiency. And the, spec the uh, quantum efficiency is simply the number of electrons that you get out of a photovoltaic uh, 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 panel or cell uh, versus the number of photons that are coming in. That's this idea that it's a quantum uh, system, quantum particle of, of electron quantum particle of photon, the ratio between the two. The spectral response uh, with some manipulation of uh, the charge on the electron, the wavelength, Planck's constant H, and the speed of light, we can also uh, convert the uh, EQE uh, external quantum efficiency to what is called the, the um, spectral response. Regardless of what you use then, you can then take what the solar spectrum is. Here's an example of different uh, solar spectra uh, standards, the ASTM a standard here. You can take the uh, measured from a satellite or a model here. In this case, it's the SMARTS model or the IEC uh, uh, global or, or uh, the standard spectrum and the spectral irradiance, which we give the symbol E. And I show some references here. But when you want to calculate the the uh, output of a photovoltaic uh, cell or array or anything, you have to then integrate the uh, product of these two, the spectral response and the uh, irradiance E. You integrate that and you get the short circuit current. All right, the soiling ratio is itself uh, a ratio, of course, uh, for that short circuit current at a given instant time. And you, we take the ratio is a reference to a clean panel. So there's a standard, an IEC standard 61724-1, uh, expresses the ratio uh, between the uh, performance of a soiled device outdoors and the performance of the same device, but without soiling. In other words, it's clean. So if it has a ratio, uh, the value of one, there's no soiling. While it decreases, uh, we said uh, we can have uh, 0.5 even um, at a particular time. So we measure over time using soiling stations, which compare clean and dirty and calculate this ratio, R ratio, S soiling, uh, although sometimes this is given different symbols. But these are the two integrals that you saw before. This integral rep represents then uh, the, the, uh, the area of the PV device, the integral from some limits, the spectral response of the device, the, uh, the irradiance, the spectral response. You multiply those two together and you, you integrate. That's your reference, that's the denominator. The, the numerator has to have then the transmission. You lose transmission with soiling. And so the name of the game in soiling is to try to estimate or, or measure the transmission or the transmission loss due to soiling. And we call the transmission uh, T, tau. And so again, this ratio, if I form this ratio from these integrals, uh, it's, a, it's the reference in the denominator and the uh, a similar integral, which has the transmission. So we want to measure this transmission as a function of wavelength at a particular time t, because it's changing. Tomorrow, you may have a dust storm in the desert. And so time t1 might not be time t, t2. So we have to specify that. So here is a couple of examples of how to uh, think about this in terms of these three quantities, the irradiance, 
the spectral response and the transmission. So these are a little bit busy, but I'll talk you through it. If we have a blue spectrum, uh, maybe it's midday. So the, the losses through the atmosphere are relatively uh, low. And so here uh, in, in this uh, top one, we have uh, uh, multi-crystalline silicon. Uh, here is the irradiance. This, is, this should, shape should be somewhat familiar to you. Here is the spectral response that's again related to the, the EQE, the external quantum efficiency. And then we can have uh, a, um, a transmission, which then gives you the result, which that you would have a loss, one minus the overall uh, transmission throughout the whole region that might be 2.1. So you might lose 2.1% of your power. If for instance, the spectrum is um, red rich, then the, the resulting uh, product between the transmission, which is not shown here, I have not shown the transmission, but in a minute I will show the transmission. Uh, but just in this case, the, the result is that you might have uh, during the same day, 1.9%. So to, to, to impress upon you that the soiling ratio is not fixed, it's due both to the time and to the spectrum. And in fact, if we have time, I'll also show that it, it depends upon the angle. If we have an amorphous silicon solar cell next to the multi-crystalline solar cell, I can have soiling losses because it has a different uh, spectral response higher for the same blue rich spectrum, 2.9% in the case of the blue rich, a red rich 2.8%. So the soiling loss can be different for different types of materials. Ahmed mentioned pyrite. If I had pyrite here, it might be closer to here. If I had cadmium telluride, it might be somewhere in the middle between amorphous silicon and multicrystalline silicon. So you really need to consider when you're thinking about soiling uh, this, this integral, the transmission, the spectrum, and the spectral response. All right. And by the way, these slides will be made available. So I told you that I didn't uh, show in the last plots, I did show the spectral response. Here is this uh, spectral response for silicon. Here is a typical uh, a, uh, ASTM G173 uh, standard solar spectrum. So that's that second term in the integral. And here is the typical curve that we get for soiling. So it starts out. Uh, uh, with a low transmission, here's the relative hemispherical uh, transmittance uh, it, in the blue and UV, the transmittance due to soiling, the tau is low. And then as we get to longer wavelengths, it becomes closer and closer to uh, some leveling off uh, uh, higher value. Not quite one, so not quite one, uh, not quite uh, unity, but at some value. So these are the three components that go into that. And you see that I've, I've shown this for a, a transmittance that we measured, this blue curve in Chennai, India, or that we measured here where I live in San Jose. So it depends upon the location and the time. Okay, so with, the, with, with that, we can um, then tell you the inspiration, uh, Ahmed, uh, mentioned innovation. Well, here is a book uh, which I think that you all can find uh, a free copy of online. It's by Mohammed uh, Iqbal, if I uh, pronounced his name correctly. And it's from the days when Ahmed and I were, were working together. Uh, it, it is telling us about the transmission of the atmosphere due to particles, these same particulate matter that I showed you. All right, so we have what's called Rayleigh sc scattering and me scattering from the particles. It depends upon the particle size. So scattering in the atmosphere by these particles is dependent upon their size. And this is well known, it's measured, and that's how we get the different solar spectra that we usually see for the atmosphere for doing uh, the uh, prediction of the output of a uh, CSP plant, or a PV plant. So 
this is the first thing that, that captured my imagination. This is the equation that's in that same book. It's called the angstrom turbidity equation in which the tau of the atmosphere as a function of lambda, the wavelength, is an exponential function of uh, a term which Angstrom called beta, uh, lambda, the wavelength, to some alpha, and some optical thickness, m. And uh, uh, many people will know that you can use uh, a device which measures at a couple of different wavelengths the transmission of the atmosphere and measure what's called the aerosol optical density, the AOD. And that's what is used to determine for the atmosphere itself when it has particles in it, the uh, uh, parameter M, the optical uh, uh, path length and the, the uh, scattering of the atmosphere, which is beta times M. So depending upon the size of the particles, I told you that that's important. Uh, alpha equals one for small, al alpha equals four for non-absorbing particles, alpha tends to zero for very large particles. So the wavelength, uh, uh, the e exponent is alpha. That describes the change over, uh, over wavelength. Uh, Angstrom himself suggested that this term would be something like 1.3. Um, all right. So with that introduction of what already exists in the book, I noticed that the shapes of the curves, this is, this is theoretical. And again, this is from the same book by Mohammed Iqbal, Academic Press. Please look it up. Uh, we could get with different alpha values and different beta values, we can get different shapes that have this same general uh, aerosol transmission, transmission tau. So I recognize this shape because we measured this same type of shape when we took glass coupons, let them soil in the desert or here in San Jose, and then measure the transmission versus a clean glass. And so I said, well, if we could get a same shape for the atmospheric transmission as we get for glass coupons, let's apply this to the particles when they have uh, deposited on a surface. There's the same particles, aren't they? So this is uh, a little model put together by uh, Thomas Germer of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, he has a software, free software that you can find at NIST, which is a mean scattering model, a very uh, complex uh, model in order to uh, try to understand the scattering that I showed you before in the atmosphere to apply that scattering to when a particle has actually deposited on a mirror for CSP or a PV module surface cover glass itself. Okay, I am going to check. Okay, I can check. All right, so. All right, so, so now comes the innovation. So in order to, con to consider the transmission of aerosols and particles on the glass of a PV module or a mirror for a CSP, we could modify that angstrom equation so that it's applicable to surfaces instead of volumes. This is an empirical approach. Unlike using full me scattering theory that I showed you my colleague Thomas Germer is doing at uh, NIST, we can use this empirical approach uh, described uh, by uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, to do the same thing that we do in the atmosphere on a surface. So the, I took the product of beta and M and combined it into a new term conceptually. I'm calling it beta surface, which talks then about the, the thickness of the particles on, the, on the, the glass surface and their strength, their density in uh, particles per unit uh, area. So that's a lumped parameter now, beta subsurface. This is a new term. And so uh, the reformulated version of this original angstrom turbidity equation then is beta sub, uh, exponential of beta subsurface. I have a little star there. And then again, a wavelength dependence, which has an alpha. That is an alpha, but I put a star on it. And then I uh, included an offset term, which is a gamma sub star. 
And this is published in a freely available article that uh, a number of international collaborators and myself published in uh, 2020. And I hope that you access this. I'll give some websites here, but it's in scientific reports uh, in 2020 in volume 10. This whole description that I'm giving you. Okay, let's see how well it fits. And we're, uh, we're calling this the modified angstrom equation, modified in the way that I've described. So the red curve is without the gamma and the, the uh, green curve is the full form of the equation. And you can see that without the gamma, we can't fit the black curve, that's actual data, in this case from uh, Chennai uh, in India or San Jose. Uh, we also fit in the paper, you can see uh, Egypt, uh, we looked at uh, Colorado, uh, we looked at Spain, we looked at other places. And in each case, we found that the R squared uh, was uh, very high and the error, the root mean square, RMSE, uh, very low. If we used uh, the full form of the equation, uh, which contained this uh, gamma offset. But you can see that when you do include it, it models the data quite well. And what you should take away from this uh, presentation, one of the things is that for natural soiling in multiple locations uh, across the planet, we always have this same general shape of low transmission in the blue region, and then slowly becoming higher transmission, never quite becoming one, uh, but this depends upon the level of soiling and that this could be uh, uh, modeled by the modified angstrom equation. Okay, so when we talk about reflection, what, what happens to the light? How do you get those curves that I just showed you? Well, uh, in the case where you have a smooth surface, uh, you have what's called just specular, um, specular reflection. Uh, if it's a white piece of paper, you have completely diffused. The light is going in all different directions. And this is called diffuse or lambersion. And in this case, where you have particles on the surface, you have some kind of a spread. Each one of these lines represents a vector of how strong the light is in a particular direction. The light is really broken up into different pieces that has different strengths at different angles. This, is, this represents a kind of a, a polar plot. Okay, so now I show you this same kind of thing applied first in the case where you don't have a, uh, a, a particles on the surface. This is a clean part of the glass. And on the right-hand side, we have the dirty glass, the soiled glass, as you can see, this contamination or soiling. So you have the incident light coming in at some angle, theta sub i. And normally, uh, if you don't have an anti reflection coating, you have something like 4% a surface reflection. You have some amount of forward scattering. And then coming through the glass, you again have uh, uh, first some absorption and then another 4% uh, reflected, 91% is uh, coming out. The situation becomes much more complicated when you have the contamination. And the transmitted light that I showed you in those previous plots, that's this term. That's what's left over. What is, what is uh, altered is the, um, the reflection and the absorption. So this is clean and dirty. Uh, AR is the anti-reflection or an anti-soiling coating, which can change and make this, uh, this situation more complex itself. So the plots that I was showing you before is a very simple experiment that uh, students can do. Take a piece of glass, put it outside, let it soil, and measure the transmission as a function of wavelength with a spectrophotometer. I hope that you do this because you can get a, a very good idea of what the soiling is. If you have a CSP system, you could instead use uh, a mirror here where in this back surface it would be a aluminum or, or a silver mirror but in this case, the same. You would measure the, the reflection as a function of wavelength. And again, this diagram is in the scientific reports paper. So now building this up, you see each slide that I've shown you is building this up from simple 
to what the reality of the situation is for soiling. Again, here's clean on the left side and contaminated or soiling on the right side. When you have a photovoltaic module, you have the, the solar cell bonded to the glass by an encapsulant, which usually matches closely, somewhat closely to the index of refraction of the glass. So there it becomes one optical block. But again, in between, you have some reflected light, which bounces around and uh, is collected by the solar cell. Now, imagine in your mind, uh, what happens when you have contamination? You have this extra uh, reflection. Each one of these would then be a vector in a particular direction. It's, it's scattering the light. So you're losing this light more. You have enhanced scattering, forward scattering, which might be a good thing uh, because the solar cell can still collect it. But you have perhaps more absorption within the module, reflected light, and it goes on to bounce again and again. So you can see that if you really wanted to model the, the effects of soiling due to contamination or soiling, the situation would be somewhat complicated, wouldn't it? So we do the, these things at least uh, initially empirically. Thank you to Al Hicks of NREL for working with me for several weeks to come up with this conceptual picture, which I hope that you uh, can and study. Ahmed, are these slides going to be available to the students? Yes. He says, I can read his lips. <laughs> uh, Prof. Ahmed, uh, your mic uh, is uh, muted. So uh, again, you, you send me a PDF file yes. and I will give it to the student upon request. Good, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay. So I hope you study that. And then this is uh, a, uh, a, again, coming back to the uh, modified Angstrom equation. Uh, we can look here at the uh, y-axis, the uh, some of the parameters. Remember, the the parameters for the uh, modified Angstrom equation are alpha, beta, and gamma. Well, here's gamma versus the uh, broadband uh, transmission. Broadband. What does it mean, broadband? That means we integrated the average transmission over a wavelength range. I think from 350 to 1100, which is applicable for um, for silicon or pyrite, if you had it. And so we did this for uh, Golden Colorado, for Egypt, for Chennai, for Spain, for England, for San Jose, uh, for Tezpur, England, and uh, excuse me, Tezpur, India. And so we looked at the, the values that we get for those different angstrom plots where we fit to the data. So these are fits to the data. And we looked uh, then at the value uh, of gamma that fits the data best. Um, oops. Uh, and we, um, and we uh, plotted its point. Again, the broadband relative hemispherical transmittance is a, a lumped transmission, not the transmission. We took the transmission over all the wavelengths, 350, to, uh, to uh, 1100 nanometers and, and took an average value of the transmission in that band. And you see it it's a, a, gives a linear relationship. We did the same thing with beta, beta subsurface versus uh, the hemispherical transmission. And this, this tells you that there, there could be some relationships which stretch across different sites that this, this modified Angstrom equations has somewhat of a universal uh, appeal and uh, utility. And so we've explored it for uh, uh, its utility as an empirical approach to modeling the transmission of, uh, of glass that could then be uh, put into models for uh, CSP and PV. Okay, so I see at 18 minutes after the hour that I have uh, some time for some conclusions that I hope that I've impressed upon you that estimating the soiling losses using the transmission from a glass coupon, it may not uh, easily translate to knowledge about the power loss from PV modules. We've measured the uh, transmission of uh, soiled glass coupons for a first step. And we find that it adheres to uh, a modified form of the angstrom turbidity equation. 
And just like I showed you in the last slide, there's a linear correlation between the area covered by the particles and the broadband hemispherical transmission. Uh, we got that from the last slide when we looked at beta. I said beta is connected to the amount of soiling versus the transmission, the average transmission, that we see that, that there's a, a, a linear correlation there. That makes sense, right? More particles means uh, uh, higher transmission losses, and we do see that. A soiling uh, produces a, uh, a characteristic shape, higher attenuation at shorter wavelengths. The Angstrom turbidity uh, formula, if modified, can handle that, can talk to us about that. And the impact of soiling is likely, therefore, because of this spectral approach, it's likely uh, higher with PV materials with a higher band gap. Uh, bl the blue rich area of the solar spectrum is affected more by soiling than the red rich area of soiling. So it's going to depend upon that. And so the soiling losses are certainly going to be a function of the optical properties. Uh, for instance, the optical properties of the particles and the amount of particles per unit area. Uh, so some of my other colleagues are looking at the optical properties of say soot or sand from the desert, and they're making plots of the transmission as a function of wavelength, uh, which might be characteristic for their region. For instance, in Egypt or, uh, or a Qatar or in Morocco, you might find different times of the year have a different transmission versus wavelength. And then you can say, oh, those particles, they seem to be more sand or calcite or soot or wood particles. And so this allows us to do a, a little bit of very easy uh, spectroscopy to, to perhaps to start to characterize soiling in different locations. Uh, let's see. How does this relate to the larger context? So I've gotten down uh, with you on the level of the particle itself. That's what I do, looking at the optics and the materials. And so we've been talking about the dust, the atmosphere, the, uh, the uh, deposition, the transport, the cementation. The particles can be glued together on the glass. Uh, I talked to you about the optics, the reflection, the EQE, the uh, the estimated power losses that I showed you in one of the first slides, the 2% or the 3% or the, or the 50%. Uh, Leo uh, Michelli, uh, my uh, friend and colleague, he'll uh, take this the next step. We take the optics and look at the monitoring, the economics, the cleaning. If you clean it, you can abrade, you can damage the surfaces of the glass or the mirror. Um, and so we talk also about coatings, anti-soiling coatings. And then we have, therefore, if we abrade, if we damage, we have to talk about the uh, reliability, the time dependence, or if there's soiling in one part of the module and the other, does this affect the electroluminescence over time? Does it produce hot spots? And what do we have to do with the solar plant operations and maintenance, or o &M. And so this sets for you that soiling starts from a particle of dust and goes to the largest possible things in looking at solar power plants. We have to consider in soiling, in the soiling field, you can find articles on all of these different aspects. These are some of, just some of my collaborators in some of the uh, universities that have contributed to this study. Uh, I mentioned Leonardo Michelli, who I hope you'll be hearing from uh, later today, and uh, I thank them all. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Chakran, if I'm pronouncing it right in, uh, in the language of where a lot of you are. Please uh, go to my website. You can uh, download for free uh, a lot of these publications that I've mentioned, and if uh, I uh, can answer some questions, uh, there's my email. So now, uh, do we have, I think we have maybe uh, 10 minutes or so of questions, or I have some other slides that I can do. Yeah, I think we can uh, give the floor to Sa Salem to moderate the, the questions and the, and the answer. Uh, uh, if there is uh, no questions, uh, you can have a uh, few minutes uh, of uh, Greg. 
Uh, so just uh, now, uh, any questions? Uh, nothing. Uh, I guess you can uh, go ahead uh, with other uh, slides. Well, I hope that either that's either two things have happened. They've fallen asleep, or I've been so clear that they have no questions. Yeah, it can be. can be. Uh, and anyone who wants to ask also, uh, you can uh, raise your hand, please. Uh, I'm sure that Ahmed, Ahmed uh, Inawi himself will have a question. Yeah, I have, but uh, Salem, he has to give me the... the... Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, just wait for the others. Uh, now you can go ahead, uh, Prof. Ahmed. Okay, Look. so uh, what we have discussed uh, until now is uh, that we have the soiling and we just make a measurement and to see the phenomena. Uh, now the, the, the questions how to resolve the problem, for example, to have super hydrophobic material to, for coating the, uh, the module that even if there are uh, some dirt, it will not be on, uh, on the module very effectively like in, in the car industry, for example, what the, they are doing. Do, do you have any Comment on that? Uh, I do, I do. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Leonardo Michelli will, will address this as well. But okay. this, this comes in this box here about the performance and the coatings. Yes. So yes. What, what we have seen, um, what we have seen is that the uh, anti-soiling coatings of which there are many, start out very promising but then very quickly they become coated with very small particles. I have a, a second part to my, uh, my talk, which looks at the microscopy. The same paper that uh, I'm describing to you has some pictures of these very small, uh, less than one micron sized particles. And they can coat the uh, anti-soiling coating that's on the glass for a glass mirror or a PV module and they render it uh, then ineffective for its uh, hydrophobic or hydrophilic characteristics. So as of yet, uh, long-term protection or long-term cleaning has been difficult to establish for all, all locations for all times. So this is an active area of research. And in, in, uh, in addition, the uh, Eventually, the, the plant is cleaned when the economics of it makes sense, when the cost of the cleaning is less than the, uh, the amount of money that you're going to lose uh, if you don't clean it. And the economic models uh, are, are things like uh, uh, Russ Jones have done and Leonardo Michelli and Clemens Ilse, their articles uh, are, are, are good about that. But then when we do clean these um, uh, coatings and these systems without coatings, we abrade, the, we, we, uh, we damage that. And so the coatings themselves and this whole thing about uh, abrasion, uh, it, it, it has not yet produced a solution to this. So I see maybe uh, there's some qu other questions. Uh, yes, uh, there is hands uh, uh, from uh, Masab. Uh, uh, please, uh, Ms. Masab, uh, you can open uh, your mic. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Salem. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Greg, for the beautiful presentation. It was very interesting. Actually, my question is about the impact of uh, the optical properties and physical chemical properties of dust on the models that you have just presented. And also my second question is about the new uh, sensors that we recently see in the market, such as Dust IQ, Mars, the optical sensors I mean, are they or uh, this, the performance of these sensors can be used in order to really represent the, the real impact of soiling on PV modules? Are they, very, are they really efficient or not? As they are optical and we want to quantify the electrical impact of soiling. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very good question. Uh, uh, Leonardo Michelli will present a little of this, but uh, you have uh, 
been keen to point out a very important thing that these are optical sensors. So that actually stimulates this work of looking very closely at the optics of the particles, both with the spectroscopy that I've described and the microscopy that uh, I have in the same paper. Um, so there has been some excellent uh, work in correlating for the different types of sensors, uh, the correlation between what's called a soiling station and the soiling monitoring sensor from these various companies. It's not exactly the same. And so it's going to be different at different times and in different locations. And so studies will have to be done for your particular location. Uh, the, the way to monitor soiling in the best way, going back to that IEC standard that's in the slides that you will be receiving, is to take uh, nearly identical modules for uh, clean and for dirty, either clean it with some automated system or clean it by hand. This one is clean, this one is dirty. Take the ratio between the two. That's the, the, the best way to do it. It will uh, not always be equivalent to what these sensors are doing. So again, it's an active area of research to try to correlate different types of sensors with these soiling stations, which you can also purchase. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Michael Valerino has some research, uh, which he published uh, in his thesis uh, on a inexpensive soiling station. Campbell Scientific also makes a soiling station. Other companies make soiling stations, which are very expensive and difficult to operate because you can imagine you have to clean one panel completely to, to make it a, a proper reference. So that uh, answers your question a little bit in that one has to be very careful about uh, correlating these optical monitoring sensors with the best measurement, which is a direct measurement between the, mod, the type of module or the type of system. We maybe have time for one more or should we? Uh, there is uh, the last uh, question. Uh, let me see it here. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Smistad, uh, for the presentation. Do you think that AS uh, divided by AR is, co uh, is cost effective for PV applications? especially in a region with harsh climate conditions. Please. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, Ale, for that excellent question. Uh, so again, um, certainly uh, anti-reflection anti coatings are now standard in uh, all photovoltaic modules. So it's been found that anti-AR uh, coatings are effective. Usually those coatings are uh, a, um, uh, a type of coating uh, which uses effective media theory, a porous coating, which goes from air and then the porosity uh, is high at the surface. They etch the glass and uh, of the top of the module uh, at the factory and it becomes more and more dense as time goes on. So you have index refraction uh, air here is one and 1 1.5 in the bulk and this porous coating is in between. That's an anti-reflection coating. Some of these anti-reflection coatings also serve as anti-soiling coatings. And for instance, First Solar has a combined coating, which has the property that I just described, which they have to use. If they don't use an anti-soiling, uh, anti-reflection coating, uh, a, a PV module will have 10% uh, or more uh, uh, reflection losses. That's unacceptable. So an anti-reflection uh, coating has to be there. They combine the anti-soiling uh, and anti-reflection coating, the, the properties of them with this porous coating, and it is cost-effective, uh, at least in that it gives still the anti-reflection uh, property. It loses over time the anti-soiling property. So when you talk about uh, being effective, one has to say, well, is it still soiling? Well, it's still anti-reflection, but it isn't anti-soiling anymore. So one has to study this over time, uh, maybe with glass coupons or, or studies to show how these properties are being lost. But uh, other types of anti-soiling coatings are not as uh, cost-effective or effective uh, uh, in itself. 
So I hope that you then visit some of the references that I've given here. Uh, and I hope that, that you won't hesitate to reach out to me uh, to ask any questions afterwards. Thank you, uh, Prof. Rick. Uh, Prof. Ahmed, uh, conclusion? Yeah, and thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Drake, my friend. I think the soling is very important. Even if you have, uh, as you said in the beginning, if you have high efficiency from research and development, if you don't resolve the problem of soiling, then we still have a bottleneck. So thank you so much for this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, Hope to have you again in the Virtual Learning University for other talk. And uh, uh, for those who are interested in the activity of uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Smistad, he has a link where uh, you can see a lot of very important topics. And they think uh, that the link we have it on our posters in, in, the, in the Facebook and the LinkedIn. Thank you so much. 